Amen, amen. Thank you for your selection for today. Actually, it fits perfect with our message today. Um, a text comes from the scripture that Dean read this morning. Uh, as a, a, a text today, I want to take John chapter 5, verse 18. And I'm reading for the New International Version. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Uh, you know, occasionally uh, people will say, I can't accept anything by faith. I have to have reason for believing. Uh, theology actually has sometimes been defined as faith seeking understanding. Let me repeat what I said. Occasionally, we would hear people say, I can't accept anything by faith. I have to have reason for belief. Now, no Christian would deny that we are saved by faith, but we're saved by faith, not faith in faith. We respond to God's gift of salvation by putting our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of the world. So, contrary to belief, Christianity is based is not based on blind faith. We have reason for believing in Jesus Christ. We have something called reasonable faith. Now, reasonable faith is believing in something because of the evidence. Reasonable faith is believing in something because of the evidence. Now, we have reasonable faith when we believe something because it is the most reasonable inference from evidence, even though we may still have some unanswered questions. For example, I believe that penicillin helps fight bacterial infection. Uh, there's laboratory evidence to support this claim, and I personally have had and have used penicillin to fight infection. I still don't know why or how penicillin works, but I have faith in penicillin even though I don't have all the answers. In a similar way, Jesus encourages us to have a reasonable faith based on the evidence he provided. Now, the greatest thing that a child of God can do is to proclaim Jesus Christ as God's Son, who was given to us for our eternal salvation, and then urge the people that we make this proclamation to, to use that information to make a decision as to what they will do with that knowledge, the knowledge we Now, if you remember, at the end of Jesus' earthly life, the apostle Pilate, the woman government as the crowd, for kill I do again with Jesus. And you find a question in Matthew chapter 27, verse 22. What shall I do? And when Jesus was called the Messiah, Pilate asked the crowd, and so the crowd answered, crucify. Now, essentially, that's the question every person must answer. What shall I do with Jesus? And there can be no half-hearted wishy-washy answer. As the scripture these way, it makes clear Jesus claims to be the son who gives life, who gives life, and to whom he gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. The scripture says Jesus claims to be the son who gives life to whoever he wants to. 
You find that in John chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is to be forgiven. Now, having said that, the Jews that Jesus was talking to were ready to kill him because they understood that he was claiming God and his Father, making himself equal with God. Remember the scripture by verse 18 of chapter 5? For this reason they prayed all the who to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. But Jesus said this in verse 24. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged for this far over from the death to life. So let's face the issue square. Let's see the issue squarely in the eye. Either Jesus is the Son of God and we must praise him, or he's a liar and deceiver. And you are free, even wise, to walk away from you. Now, if that sounds radical to you, just think about the crowd that Jesus was talking to. Jesus, remember, Jesus was a Jew, and the people he was talking to him were Jews. The Jews had made a decision based on the word of God that there's only one God. Remember, Jesus and the people he was talking to were Jews, and Jews believed in the bedrock conviction that the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord our God is one Lord. That's what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. So, these people were monotheists, which means they believe that there's only one God, and these people also knew from their history the awful result of idolatry. So, for Jesus to claim to be God's son in a unique and shocking way was either blasphemy or a fantastic miracle. There was no middle ground. And the question for us is we would either decide as to them, decide to come to him and follow him as God's son, or we would decide to walk away from him, rejecting his claim to be the giver of life. And if you walk away, if you decide to walk away, you face the judgment that God will place in the hands of his son. What it says in John 5, verses 25 through 27. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear him, fear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son all who have, who have life in himself, and he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. If Jesus did not simply claim to be the Son of Man, which is a Christian uh, title, he didn't simply claim to be the Son of Man and Son of God and expect, he didn't make this claim and expect the people to believe it just because he said it. He offered witnesses to the truth of his claim. Now, Jesus presented three witnesses as evidence of the integrity of his claim. Those witnesses were John the Baptist, the work that he did, and the Father himself through the scriptures. Now, John the Baptist testified on Jesus' behalf. You look at look at John chapter five, verses thirty one through thirty five. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is 
true. You sent to John, and he testified to proof. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. God was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you, uh, and you chose for a time to rejoice. Plus, now, the power of God that has to witness uh, was in the fact that he was courageous and had integrity in his ministry. Everyone knew John was a truth teller no matter what the cost was. You know, he, when he preached before the crowds and they came to hear him, he did not mince his words or seek to sue. Uh, his words were like a hot coal. And so he pressed the weighty judgment of God now on the mind of his people. Quick, quickly, I'm going to read Matthew 3, uh, verses 7 through 10. to kind of tell you the kind of preachers John was. Matthew 3, 7 through 10. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptized, and he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee, flee from the coming wrath? Produce proof in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that I will be stoned. God can raise up to the for Abraham. Acts is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce the fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, read that to show you that John did not play around. So they did, so his witness would have been a good one. John had been the first person to see and to understand. Uh, John 1, verse 29. The next day, John. John saw Jesus coming for him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in verse 34 of that same chapter, he said, I have seen and testified that this is God's true Son. Now, when John realized this, John the preacher realized that Jesus was the Messiah. The Son of God, he did something very amazing. He turned his entire congregation over to somebody else, to Jesus. He said of Jesus, he ranked before me because he existed before me. John chapter 1 verse 30 says, this is John best talking. This is the one I meant when I said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. And he said there in John, John 3, verse 30, John chapter this, he must become greater, I must become less. So Jesus said, look at John the Baptist and his witness of me. There's some evidence. The mighty works of Jesus, the works that he did, also bear witness to his authority. Verse 36 of John 5 says, I have testimony greater than that of John for the works, for the works that the Father has given me to finish, the, the very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. And no magician. No magician could do the work Jesus did. Jesus had turned water into wine. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. He told a woman about all about her life, and he did, had given her the living life that brought joy to her, and she's never known him. That story, the story of the woman in the well, is in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. You know, Jesus is another word. Jesus healed a man who had been sick for 38 years. You can find that in John chapter 5, verse 1 through 9. Jesus would feed a multitude of more than 5,000 people from a small shared lunch. Find that, that evidence in John chapter 6, verses 5 through 14. And he would raise a man who had been dead for four days. He would raise him from the dead. That was last. You can find that in John chapter 11, 
verses 1 through 44. So every work, every mighty work was a sign that brought people into the awareness of God's establishment and love for them. These works that Jesus offered were a witness to Jesus' claim. Okay? John the Baptist and the work. Then Jesus cited the witness of the Father himself through the scriptures. Uh, John chapter 5, verses 37 through 40 would say, John 5, 37 through 40, and the Father who sent me has testified to me. You have never heard his voice of being informed, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in him you have earned eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet your views come to me and have life. Now, the Messianic prophecies of the prophets were used uh, by early Christian preachers as evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. But, in the conversation that Jesus was having with the Pharisees, Jesus went all the way back to Moses, who was the lawgiver himself. So Moses was the most important religious person in Jewish history. Jesus claimed Moses' witness in the scripture as God's witness to the truth of Jesus' claim to be God's son. John 5. 45-46. But do you think I would accuse you before your father? Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about it. You know, now Moses, we wrote the first five books of the Bible. We call it the, Bible, the first five books of the Holy Bible. So you this was the law. For the Jews, these books constituted the Mosaic law. The first of these books is Genesis. And here's what Moses wrote in Genesis about what God told me in the Garden of Eden. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will crack his heel. And Jesus was the offspring of the woman who would indeed prove the heel of the evil. So when Jesus was saying, we didn't believe Moses who wrote about it. Jesus was the offspring that Moses wrote about. It. Jesus was also the fulfillment of the law, the Mosaic law that God gave to Moses and Moses wrote down. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of Christ. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least sort of being, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now Jesus sought to move the faith and worship of the people past the written word to the living word, past the scriptures, to the one whom the scriptures were written about, the one to whom, of whom the scriptures bear witness. Jesus is the one who is the Savior in which there is eternal life. What Moses wrote about, he wrote about Jesus. John 5, 24 says, very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And he will not be judged, but has crossed over from life to death. And here's what verses 39 and 40 have testified. You can study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, that you refuse to come to me and have life. So the witnesses he's presented, John the Baptist, 
the works and the scriptures that were of God breathed. Right? Now today, today, we can add even more evidence, more witness to the claim, to establish the claim of Jesus' unique place as God's son. Because the first is history. We have the advantage of over 2,000 years of experience with the life and teachings of Jesus. Now, this historical argument points to what is meant to the world by that Jesus lived among us. From history, we can see how much Jesus meant to the world he lived among us. A decade ago, many years ago, an anonymous person wrote, he was born in a few village. He worked in a carpenter shop in the Then for three years, he became an itinerant preacher. Nineteen centuries, this was written some time ago. Nineteen centuries have come and gone to the day. He is the central figure of the human race. All the armies that have marched, all the navies that have sailed, all the parliaments that ever set, all the kings that ever reigned have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary one, Jesus Christ. But this because there's been no person that has affected this world more than Jesus Christ. Now, not only do we have history, but we have the entirety of Jesus' life. Now, there was a harmony in Jesus' life between what he taught and how he lived. They harmonized. There was a harmony in what he said and what he did. Jesus was who he said he was. When he said it was true, he proved. Now Jesus said, a seed must fall into the ground and die if it is to live. And then he went to the cross and offered himself in death. Jesus did what he did. He taught a seed must fall into the ground and die in order to live. But if it's to live, then it must be in the ground. He then went to the cross and offered himself in death for us. Here's what he said in John chapter 12, verses 23 and 24. Thou hast come with the Son of Man and glory. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces much seed. He just said it. And then he did it. Jesus said, you must love your enemies. Matthew 5, 43 to 45, you have heard that it was said, I mean, love your favorite and your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise in the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the right and unrighteous. So Jesus said, you must love your enemies. He proved it because as he hung on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Love your enemies. He killed him then. He proved his love for them by saying, asking the Father to forgive them. The ability to complete his mission which was salvation for mankind, and to live completely as he taught is evidence of his claim to be the Son of God. The church is a witness. The life of the church after the crucifixion of Jesus would lead one to believe Jesus was much more than an ordinary man. Jesus has not been raised from the dead. There would have been no momentum for the church to go on. So you remember the disciples were defeated and dejected and disheartened 
until Jesus appeared to them after the resurrection and empowered them and sent them forth. We all know the Great Commission, uh, Matthew 28. Uh, verse, I'm going to read verses 16 through 20. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. The eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. He saw them and worshipped him, but some doubt. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you all the way to the very end of the age. The very existence of the church. The baptizing that we do, observing the Lord's Supper, preaching the word, and seeing life change is evidence of the truth of Jesus' claim to be the Son of God. Church is a witness. The, uh, what did I say? The church is a witness. History is a witness. And the entirety of Jesus' life is a witness. There's one more. There's one more witness today uh, that we, more evidence we can provide. Your life is a witness to Jesus' claim. This one for Do you experience being in the brokenness of the part of their daily experience? Do you know the dark feelings of guilt that arise not because someone's trying to let it disappoint you, but because you are really guilty? Do you know about coming to the end of the day and having no way to live for another day? Do you know about loneliness and a need for love that's frustrated over and over? by the counterfeit imitations of real love? Are you afraid to die knowing what, if it is even ahead of you, are you afraid to die not knowing what's ahead of you? Have you ever reached most of your goals in life but are finding some discomfort that the goals you reach? This is good for me. Have you ever reached much of your goals in life but are finding with some discomfort that the goals you achieve? May it not have been worth what it has cost to your season. But if any of this description, any of this description of human need touches you deeply, then Jesus has come to touch and heal you at the point of your need. Jesus is the one who heals our brokenness. Jesus is the one who forgives our sin. Jesus is the one who removes our guilt by his own deep acceptance of us. doesn't matter who you are. Jesus is the hope that gives us purpose in life. It is Jesus' love that makes us know we are important and valuable to God. He is our eternal life, the one who fulfills the living of life now, who gives direction, in setting our goals, and who will eventually escort us through death into the full and blessed presence of the eternal God. So, if Jesus is not God in the flesh, you are free to walk away. But if he is God in the flesh, you must believe or face the unhappy consequences of your unbelief. We read this in the scripture, John 5, verses 24 through 29. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes it will send me has eternal life and will not be judged as cross over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the of the Son of God and those who here will live. For the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority 
He does because he is the son of man. And I'd be amazed at this. For time is coming when all who in his grave will be born and come out. Those who have done what is good will right to live, and those who have done what is evil will right to die and be condemned. So, he either is, or he isn't. You either will, or you won't. You will either live, or you will die. You choose. It's your choice. I urge you, based on the evidence that I was going to give today, is presented by Jesus, I urge you to believe Jesus and choose life. Now, most, maybe, most of us, maybe all, but maybe not all, are believers. So we have the assurance that wherever we are, Jesus, God, is smiling on us and is gracious and attentive to us, and he wants to give us peace. But this promise is only for the child of God. Blessings of the Bible are only for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, who claim with heaven to be God. Jesus was cursed so that we could be blessed. He died so that we could live, and he was forsaken so that we could be forgiven. I'm going to say this to those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. The Bible says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, has it become a curse for us, for it is written, curse is anyone who hangs on a tree. The curse, Christ came to redeem us from it. The choice is yours. Do you want to face the curse of your sin, or do you want the blessings of God in your life? Because God said that, Today, this is in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Today, I have given this choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. God has made it clear. He wants to bless you. He wants to come into your life. For those who have not accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior, I'm going to direct you to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 13. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you will be saved. But if with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and the richest blessed all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you haven't done this, do that today. I urge you today. If there's anyone here who wants to do that, you want to talk to me after service, please do that. Anyone who's watching on Facebook or later on on YouTube, you make the decision to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Tell somebody, uh, put it in the comments, in the comments on Facebook or on, on YouTube, and let us rejoice with you. Remember this Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And because of that, the Jews knew that he was claiming to be equal with God and he was claiming to be God. Jesus never said have faith in him without evidence. And today I gave you three witnesses to back up the claim that he made before the Jews for which they wanted to kill him. Jesus is God. He provides a witness uh, by the works, by his life, and by the scriptures. So today, the choice 
is yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you that you have not commanded us to believe in you without evidence. We have evidence. We know that Jesus is the Son of God. We know that he came to this earth to sacrifice himself for us. We know that because of you, Jesus, you, you came to this earth. You took on human form, sacrificed yourself for us, for you for us. All that is required of us is to believe and to trust. Father, we thank you and we pray. In the name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to pronounce the benediction, and then uh, we're going to end the service uh, here today. And so for, uh, we're going to start the memorial service for, for Mr. Campbell in about 10 minutes or so. So I'm going to pronounce the benediction. Uh, we believe those of you who have to leave can leave. Uh, we won't pray the folks to I'll pronounce the benediction. And then we will have the memorial service in just a few minutes. May Christ dwell in your heart too, that you, be rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, both the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ as it passes all knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The Lord bless you and keep you.